All right, last time we talked about thermal expansion uh, and whether our, uh, the stresses created in our column by that thermal expansion. Um, and we decided uh, that it wasn't gonna explode, it was just gonna have some built-in stresses. But at some point, uh, that will actually buckle. It will, uh, the column uh, will um, fall apart. <laughs> we don't want that to happen. Uh, usually. All right, so mostly when we talk about buckling, we're talking about long members because when they're short, when we have a short column, uh, the chances of buckling is much less. Uh, but basically what we're, happens is when we have a compressive force here, um, you, there is the possibility that with, you know, there's nothing happening here in the x direction, right? There's nothing that'll make it deflect laterally. Uh, and so theoretically, we could continue to push and push and push just in this y direction. Uh, and that material might yield at some point, uh, but we would never get it actually where it would split off to the side. That though is that idealization of that. It's not very realistic because um, we have things that push something, a uh, column, let's say the column of this water tower, that push it in the horizontal direction. Uh, vibrations caused by a truck rumbling past or by a, uh, um, a small earthquake, um, wind, um, you know, something banging into it. Uh, there are all sorts of things that in real life might cause a column to move a little bit in the horizontal direction. Uh, and what happens is once it moves a little bit in that horizontal direction, there's the possibility uh, that that downward pressure, which is now pointed not directly down, but sort of in that direction, uh, will cause that to keep bending. Uh, and that's why this becomes what's called an equilibrium analysis. Uh, buckling happens um, when a small oscillation happens or a small vibration happens to a column and the X direction forces turn out to be stronger um, than in the direction causing the buckling to continue than they are in the direction to push that column back to its original shape. And we want to know when, when do we reach that equi equilibrium, right? What, what, applied force in the axial direction uh, makes that the case. So buckling is complicated. Uh, it's much, uh, mathematically, it's much more complicated certainly uh, than the stuff we've been doing with axial deformation. So if we take a stiff member that's bent elastically, so we get that little vibration, uh, it wants to bend itself backwards. So you take a meter stick and you bend it right? And then I let go and it's going to sort of flat back to its straight position, right? Um, if I push harder, I might get it to bend farther, right? If I apply a bigger P, I'll get a bigger bow in that meter stick. Uh, but there's clearly something trying to push it back in, into its original shape. It's, a, it's an elastic deformation, right? It wants to go back to where it started from. We can model this <laughs> like this, which is in some ways kind of a silly uh, model uh, because we don't have springs attached to our, uh, to our columns, but it provides us a nice sort of starting point. This guy, this pressure down here, this force P is now directed partly in the X direction and it's pushing off to the right, right? That pressure P goes along this member, and so it's directed downwards. This one's directed upwards and to the right. So the overall x direction force created by P is in the rightward direction. The, the fact that that column wants to be straight and return to its original position is effectively what's creating this spring, right? Uh, and so that's pushing back against P. Uh, and so what we're going to try and figure out here is when does the X component of P become larger than K? 
Um, and as P gets bigger, obviously, that X component is going to get bigger. Uh, and it also has something to do with the angle theta here, right? If I bend something quite a bit, uh, there's a better chance that it's going to break. And if we do a little mathematical analysis, and you can look in the text to do this, but I don't want to spend too much time on this spring metaphor. Um, we want to know the balance between the restoring force, that is K here, uh, and the disturbing force, that is P, the X component of P pushing off to the right. And we would find that it's a relationship between K, how strong the restoring force is, P, how strong the compressive force is, and L, okay? The longer L is, the more uh, buckling is, uh, a column is in danger of buckling. Now, as this guy notices, KL over four doesn't help us a whole lot because there isn't a spring force here, right? We, we don't have a K, but we can figure out ways to describe that K uh, in terms that we've used already in the class, okay? An analysis of um, the, the internal moment um, of a column that's, for instance, pinned, we have this pinned on both ends, um, we can figure out an equation uh, in terms that we understand. And again, I'm not going to go through this derivation. If you want to look at this, you can figure it out. But essentially, this is a way of saying, what is K? in a column. Uh, and if we figure out what K is, then we can start to figure out what the pressure has to be uh, in order to create a um, create a, a buckling load. We get a little vibration. If you reach that pressure critical, if the pressure that's applied or the, the, the compressive force is applied that's bigger than P critical, then you're going to be in danger of buckling. And if we look at this, you can see that your modulus of elasticity makes that critical force high, right? That makes sense, right? If the column is stiff, then it's going to be harder to buckle. If its I is bigger, and we'll talk about I more in the next couple of days, that is, if it's got a large cross-sectional area, let's stick with that for the time being for I. Um, then it's going to be hard to buckle. Uh, and then if it's long, it's going to be easier to buckle. This equation here is called the Euler load. So if you reach that Euler load, uh, that column is in danger of buckling. Okay, so we talked about this. We're going to, there's another lecture that you'll watch today is on moment of inertia. So we'll get an idea of what that means. Um, but if the area, the cross-sectional area is far from the axis, uh, then you're going to be in danger of buckling. And you can see that again, think of the meter stick, right? This meter stick is not going to buckle uh, in the X direction. That's because there's a lot of mass far away from an axis of, of the center axis of this uh, that would keep it from buckling in that X direction. It's going to buckle in the Y direction uh, because there's not that much stopping it from bending that way. A short length L makes it uh, buckle resistant. And here's uh, a column will tend to buckle around a particular axis um, for the moment of inertia, and that's what we were just talking about before. Here, it's going to buckle, we call this buckling around the x-axis, um, and it's not going to buckle around the y-axis. All right, so in design, a critical stress is more useful than a critical load. So it's easy to make that jump. We just divide this by A. But when we do that, um, this, the form of this changes and becomes, um, has a couple of different terms in it uh, that we want to make sure we understand. 
The first is this R. What's R? Uh, R here is the radius of gyration. Um, so that's defined as a function of the area as well as the moment of inertia. What does this mean? Well, basically this is talking about the relationship, how much, um, how much of that cross-sectional area is far from our axis, okay? If we have a, if it's close to our axis, um, then this, again the math is a little uh, tough here. This this is a uh, in the denominator in the denominator, so we can kind of think of it as being in the numerator. If you have a large radius of gyration, you're going to have a large critical stress. Okay, so if your area cross-sectional area is far from your axes, from the central axes of your cross-sectional column, um, then you're gonna, it's gonna be hard to buckle a column. Remember that th this analysis, the stress within a column, there are two ways a column can fail. It can buckle, uh, but it can also fail due to compression, right? If I compress that material so much that it starts to yield, um, then you have a different kind of failure. It's basically just, uh, it's being crushed. Um, and so if your Euler stress is higher than your yield stress, it's going to yield before it buckles. Okay. And so we need to tech, test, uh, we need to figure out what each of these are, um, before we know whether, which is the problem we have to deal with. And then finally, uh, L over R in the denominator here is what's called the slenderness ratio. Um, so a slender column is much more liable to buckle. Uh, and this becomes sort of a shorthand for us when we talk about columns. Uh, a slender column is one that we need to worry about buckling. Uh, a, a slenderness ratio that's quite low, uh, on the other hand, is not going to be uh, much of a problem uh, in terms of buckling. And so if we wanted to, we can pull that R out uh, from up here and restate that. But essentially, um, this is what's uh, the uh, value that we, that we want to know. But if you need to calculate that directly, you can use this equation. So what does that mean up here? Uh, well, if I look at this, let's take steel, for instance. If I have a column that has a slenderness ratio that's very high, right? That is a slender, thin column, then my critical stress is gonna be quite low, okay? I'm not gonna be able to put a huge load on that uh, for fear that it's gonna buckle. As I make that column shorter or thicker, my slenderness ratio is going to go here. So if my slenderness ratio is 100, my yield or my critical stress here is going to be about 25. Um, or, you know, 25 or so. If I keep making this shorter and stockier and I get to right here, no longer does my critical stress matter. Because at this point, um, I've reached my yield stress, uh, and that column is going to crush before it buckles. Okay, so as I look at this and I think about what my slenderness ratio is, my the critical stress, the stress I'd have to worry about is here for anything along in here, but then it swoops down. So this column is going to yield at 36 KSI. This is column is going to yield at 36. I make it more and more slender. This is going to yield at 36. This is going to buckle at 34. That's going to buckle at 25. That's going to buckle at 10. Okay. And so uh, a column can fail in those two different ways. And we need to keep that uh, in mind as we look at these at plots like these.
Okay, there's one more component to this that we have to take into account, and that is how are the ends of the columns attached, right? If we think about a column that's pinned that can rotate at both ends, there's a lot more chance that's going to buckle than if I have a fixed end on both ends, right? That fixed end is going to make it more and more the restoring force trying to keep that column straight is going to be a lot stronger. Uh, and so it's going to be harder for that column to buckle. So if I fix those supports, uh, it's less likely that I'll have a problem with buckling. And so we use a, a factor K um, and put that into our Euler equation uh, in order to account for the, the, the nature of our attachments. So we change our effective length, uh, and this gives us a new way of writing our Euler's formulas. So there's a lot going on here with buckling. Um, and there's actually, we're just skimming the surface here um, in, this, in this course. We're not going to go into a great deal of detail. But let's do a problem uh, with buckling and make sure we understand how we can use some of those equations. So here we have a column. And we want to know what the largest axial load it can support before it buckles uh, or before it yields. Uh, and let's say our yield stress is 50 KSI. Um, so that's going to, if our critical stress is higher than 50 KSI, we don't really need to worry about buckling. We need to worry about uh, compression. Um, if it's lower than that, then we need to worry about whether the column might buckle. So we need to look up, uh, this is, you know, sort of standard stuff as we deal with more complex uh, cross-sectional members, uh, we can look in the Appendix B of our um, textbook and it'll tell us uh, the area of this kind of column. It'll tell us the cross-sectional uh, um, moment of inertia both across the x-axis and the y-axis, right? Notice that the one across the x-axis is bigger. Why? Because if uh, this is my x-axis. I have a lot more mass here that's far from the axis, right? A lot of the mass of this, uh, or a lot of the area of this cross-section is far from that x-axis, as opposed to on the y-axis, a lot of the mass lies right along that axis. And so my, um, my i-x is going to be bigger than i-y. And what does that mean about the direction it's going to buckle? Well, it's going to buckle along the i-y axis, right? because there's less stuff out here that's going to try and keep it from bending. Oh, I just gave you the answer. So if you've forgotten, <laughs> you can go back and think about that. Which, about which axis is buckling more likely to curve? All right, and now, we want to find that critical load. And so we're going to use Euler's equation here. We're going to assume pinned on both ends because uh, we've got a pin here and a pin there. Um, this is my E for steel. This is my smallest I, right, across the Y axis. And that's my length squared, right? I don't have a K here because my K is one uh, because it's a uh, pin. And that tells me that my critical load is 512 kips. So now we want to calculate the critical stress Right, which is just, we can just do that. We don't have to go back and refigure this equation. We know the critical load, uh, the critical stress is P critical over A. Okay, and then you're going to compare that to the yield stress of steel, uh, which I believe we had at 50 KSI. Uh, 
and then we'll go on. And so we're going to take that area there, divide it out. That gives us a critical stress of 50 KSI. A, a stress higher than this will lead to potentially buckling. But if we raise the stress level, right, let's say we start at zero and add some load and it goes to 25 to 30 to 40 to 45, it's going to yield at 50 before we even get to 56. So buckling is not something that we'd have to worry about with this column. So now we can go back and solve um, what the force P applied to the column uh, will cause the steel to yield. So this really isn't even a buckling problem, right? We can go back and say, oh, I it's an axial force. I know what my cross-sectional area is. I know what my force is. And so I can find, or I know what my stress is. Uh, when it yields, um, I can find my force P. And that's it for, uh, for buckling.